This video is going to be about nematodes, and um, uh, uh, nematodes are a model organism, uh, similar to fruit flies. And uh, it's exciting to talk about nematodes because you can see here that uh, we're going to focus in class on two stories uh, from nematodes, and they're covered in our book. Uh, in our uh, chapter readings that we're jumping ahead and to kind of jump into a specific topic in our course and um, and learn a lot of developmental biology by doing that. And so the thing that's exciting about them is that um, you know a lot of students that take uh, developmental biology are pre-med students and when they hear that all of cancer biology is developmental biology and all of regenerative medicine is developmental biology and all this talk of stem cells is developmental biology, they think, well, we should just be talking about human bodies exclusively throughout the course. And the fact is, we rarely directly talk about human bodies. And that's because all those discoveries are made in simpler model organisms. And so it's exciting to see this because the Nobel Prize that they're referring to here on this slide, that's not awarded in biology. The Nobel Prizes were established about 120 years ago, and at that time, biology wasn't a very strong field uh, compared to, say, chemistry and physics and math. So there are Nobel Prizes in chemistry, physics, and math, and economics. And then there's a Nobel Prize in physiology or me and medicine, right? So the Nobel Prize is not developmental biology, and because of it, uh, not in developmental biology or biology. So like, it'd be pretty impossible for somebody studying a plant to win a Nobel Prize like that. It's really kind of a curious thing and it's just a historic thing. So this is the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine and it's awarded to these people who had tremendous impacts on human health and a study of disease. For example, program cell death is a huge part of cancer biology. Cancer is really cells that are growing out of control, and there are usually two reasons. One is they're dividing out of control, and two is they're failing to go through this program cell death process. So it's just great to talk about nematodes because they are greatly significant for our health. The next thing is that when we think of nematodes, um, and in general in model organisms, it's good to have like, oh, what are they famous for? And nematodes are famous for several things like that. And we'll learn about them. And so um, uh, we'll be able to kind of point to nematodes and say, yeah, that's when we think of that, uh, we think of nematodes. Now, those uh, things they're famous for are also important in other organisms. But, you know, it just helps us kind of compartmentalize our learning and put it in different places. So we're going to talk about program cell death and then this discovery of uh, RNA interference that we've talked about uh, in, in our course already. And um, so nematodes. And um, uh, I like this quote from Nietzsche because it's about orthologs. When we say that, you know, worms are related to us, when we say it's a model organism, we're, we're talking about orthologs. We're, we're talking about that molecular level mechanism of action and how we can identify common tools, you know, gene products, common tools in nematodes and humans and everything in between, you know, even though we're separated by hundreds of millions of years of evolution, there's a evolutionary tree to show you that nematodes are fairly closely related to arthropods, so insects and so forth, but they're a soft body worm. Um, they undergo um, molting, they shed uh, their exoskeleton, or in their case, just their thin skin, similar to arthropods. So they're in, they're related to them, but distantly related to them. And you can see very distantly related to uh, vertebrates and us. It's been hundreds of millions of years. So it's fascinating. And, you know, one of the most exciting things that humans have ever discovered of anything, uh, you know, in the history of, uh, of the world like that. So again, nematodes fit into this model organism uh, story. And these are all model organisms. And that's because you know a model organism is something, oh, it's easy to grow in lab. You can do genetics on it like that, manipulate it, it's simple, uh, grows and matures rapidly like that, reproduces rapidly, right? But there is a thing that that is so um, sort of obvious 
but fundamental uh, that rarely gets mentioned, and that is it's because these guys have orthologs that uh, make them a model organism, is that, that we can learn about our own bodies uh, literally by studying these simpler organisms. And of course, we can learn about biology in general, not just focused on you know human biology, but the, and all, all biology. And so the nematode, C. elegans. So people call it C. elegans. Nematode is actually a group of uh, closely related worms. I think it's about 200 species. Some of them have a significant impact in agriculture. Uh, so they live in the dirt and they affect uh, agriculture. Some are pests where they, uh, you know, damage crops, roots, and stuff like that. So, so people are concerned about this bigger group of nematodes because of um, agricultural issues. Then some are actually parasites of humans. So there's some direct, uh, you know, medical significance of nematodes for human health like that. C. elegans is the scientific name, Cyanorhabditis elegans, is the scientific name for this worm. It doesn't even have a common worm because it just isn't, it's not a pest and it's in the soil, it's a soil nematode, but it's just a small player in the, you know, soil environment and, and helping, you know, establish the, you know, soil ecosystems. So people just call it C. elegans. And, um, um, and um, uh, when we think of C. elegans, one of the things that we think of is this. There's a kind of microscope. It's a regular light microscope that has a special prism. So the light shines through a prism and it bends the light a little bit and it creates this natural shadowing effect. So you can see on the slide, those are cells and you can see the nucleus and the nucleus in this cell have a kind of a three dimensional look to them. And it's just because of the shadowing that the prism does in this microscope. And that became a really significant way to study nematodes because you can shine this microscope on a living nematode and you can see all its cells and you can watch it grow and divide. This type of microscope and, uh, and uh, the prism uh, have these names. They're called Nomarski optics or differential interference contrast microscopy. We should just learn that DIC. So we could call this DIC microscopy. And when we think of nematodes, we think, oh, they use that DIC microscopy. And that's great in an intro developmental biology lab uh, uh, lecture course to just learn that, you know, that that developmental biologists use microscopes a lot and, the micro and there are a variety of different types of microscopes and, uh, you know, different applications. And people love to look at nematodes with these Narmowski optics or DIC. So here's just a little video of a nematode to show you and see that's it's moving along. And what's going on there is these are model organisms because they're very easy to, to raise. They are raised in a Petri dish like you've seen, like in microbiology, a petri dish that has auger uh, gel material in it with some nutrients. And um, uh, nematodes eat bacteria. So to raise a nematode, what you do is you take one of those nutrient auger plates, sterile plate, you add some bacteria. So you spread some bacteria on the surface, let that start growing, and then add nematodes. And that nematode is crawling across the surface of a petri dish. That's how they're studied in a lab. Stacks and stacks of these petri dishes with the different nematodes, with the different you know, genetic backgrounds that they have, different strains of a nematode. And um, this nematode is being illuminated by uh, DIC microscopy. You can see along um, its body, there are some big cells. Those are egg cells like that. Over on the left, you might see things getting kind of mixed around and some smaller nuclei and stuff happening there. That, those are cells that have been fertilized and are starting to develop because nematodes are um, uh, either male, or C. elegans is either male or a hermaphrodite. And right here, there's an opening where the eggs emerge. This is a hermaphrodite. It's making eggs here and sperm here, and they're joining here, and it's self-fertilizing, and it's producing fertile babies. So there are genetic tricks to this species that make it a valuable model organism. Really pretty DIC optics here showing the animal. It's just uh, 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 a normal light microscope with that prism, that, that, uh, that differential interference contrast uh, uh, prism in it, okay? And... Um, 
Um, a, an adult uh, C. elegans is just probably just too small to see. Uh, that you could maybe see it with your uh, um, naked eye like that, but that's about how big they are. And so there could be hundreds and hundreds on a little petri dish like that. Okay, and that's how they're raised in lab. You can freeze them and thaw them. They're very convenient, and they grow up really fast. Here's their life cycle. So fertilize the egg and it divides and it, you see it goes through these L stages. These are larval one, two, three, four, and then adult. And it's shedding its skin like uh, you know a growing caterpillar during that time because uh, it's very distantly related to caterpillars. And so you can look at it all the time as it's developing like that. So a lot of reasons to model organism. What's the number one reason? Orthologs. And we're going to run into those of course in this story, right? So two stories, uh, program cell death, and then this time we have maturation. We'll talk about the first story first. And in talking about it, uh, one of the reasons we're talking about it is developmental biologists are, are, are uh, you know, a huge percentage of developmental biologists are geneticists. And so we're going to use nematodes in our course to kind of put some genetic analysis stories in here. And um, this genetic work that we're going to talk about in these stories was done in the 1990s like that so you know not that very long ago and uh, we're going to talk about the genetic strategy for the work to get done so um, if you want to study uh, program cell death uh, a powerful way is to do it genetically and the way you do that is you would find mutations and those mutations would be uh, affecting program cell death um, so let's say you know a cell is supposed to die for program cell death and it doesn't die. Well, maybe there's a mutation in the gene that's essential for the program cell death process to occur. So that's the genetic strategy. And uh, in genetics, you could start out in nature and find a mutant that was defective. And that's been done historically a lot, where there's a random mutation in nature and it affected an important process. You bring that into a, a laboratory setting and study it. Find that gene, find out what the role of that gene is in the process. On the other hand, uh, you just don't want to wait around for that. And so with C. elegans, what scientists do is in the laboratory setting, they expose a tens of thousands of, of, of C. elegans to some sort of mutagen. So something that's going to cause mutations like uh, radioactivity, like x-rays, right? Those are going to cause random, ra random mutations. And we just need to speed up the process of discovering mutations. So let's make a lot of mutations happen in lab. And then we screen those. Then we look for nematodes that have the problem that we're interested in. So these scientists that were studying program cell death looked for um, mutants in the lab of C. elegans that had a problem with program cell death. And when they find one, there's one, they breed it. And when they breed it, they say that's a strain. And a strain is similar to a breed of dogs, right? all these nematodes, they're all C. elegans, they're the same species, but there's one that has a mutation that's defective in program cell death, and it must have a mutation in a gene that's essential for program cell death, and so let's save that one, let's breed it, let's just let it self-fertilize like it's a hermaphrodite, right? So it can just self-fertilize, and we'll grow that, and we call that a strain. So we're gonna have lots of strains, and we're just gonna number them because we're working in a lab and they're not a new breed of dog, but they are a distinct strain. And like a breed of dog, they breed true. We can just keep breeding that strain and self-fertilizing it and we'll maintain that strain's identity different from others. It's got a mutation in that gene, okay? So in lab, when we create these mutations, they're random. So we have to do these screens. We have to look through tens of thousands of C. elegans nematode worms that were mutated in order to find ones that are interesting to us because they have a problem in program cell death. Okay, so that process, those are referred to as induced mutations. They're uh, essentially natural mutations because mutations are random, but they, we just are hurrying up the process. Then that gets done, and that was done in the 1990s on the basis of this work. Nowadays, in our developmental biology course, we talk a lot about reverse genetics. A good example of that is just to use C. elegans as an example. Scientists 
discovered the genes that regulate programmed cell death first in nematodes. And then they wanted to study them in other species. So they had the gene in nematodes, and instead of starting over in fruit flies or mice, you know, like that, uh, or humans, um, what they could do is they could do a blast search using the nematode DNA to just search on a computer for the most closely related gene in fruit flies or mice. And when they found that, that was probably the ortholog. And they could start studying it. And they'd have a gene in mice they wanted to study. And, um, um, and they didn't have to do a, a, a genetic screen they just want to damage that gene. And they did that, by, do that by uh, knocking out the gene or knocking down the gene in order to study it. And that's called reverse genetics. So um, traditional genetics is uh, looking for mutants either in nature or induced mutants in lab, doing genetic screens, and then finding that gene. And that's the, what was done a lot in C. elegans in the 1990s, and it continues today, but especially a lot of it was done in the 1990s we're talking about today. Nowadays, lots of reverse genetics done. So uh, uh, we'll talk about that in the second story in this um, C. elegans work because C. elegans uh, uh, developmental valve just discovered a process called RNA interference that allows them to uh, knock down gene expression. And just to say this, just to say this, you know, in the 1990s, so not very long ago, none of these genes were known. So scientists had to do uh, traditional genetic screens to identify the genes. Now, today, uh, uh, scientists have, have, have developed strains of nematode where they have individual strains that knock down each gene in the nematode genome. And they're all frozen, and you just order them. So that's kind of uh, like, like really um, dramatic reverse genetics, where you just like, well, you know, probably people are going to want to do reverse genetics on these genes and in this organism. So let's just make down, knock down strains of every one of the genes so they can just order them and we'll just hand them out. Okay, so that uh, RNA interference is part of the second story in this and uh, just bring it up now because of how there are a variety of genetic approaches. We're focusing in this story on program cell death. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And uh, I guess we'll do it in the context of this. So here are the three scientists that won the Nobel Prize. And in our course, you don't need to remember scientists' names. I just like this because of the great uh, picture of the three scientists, the interviewers on the right. And the three scientists really have postures that de de depict their role in this discovery. And the discovery is program cell death, so our first story. And um, the uh, scientist on the left is a guy named uh, uh, Sidney Brenner, and uh, he, back in the 1960s, wanted to uh, develop, to produce, kind of uh, go after a new model organism. And he's the one who dis decided C. elegans would be a good candidate. You know, it was very easy to grow in lab, blah, 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 like that, right? So here he is in this interview explaining that and explaining, you know, kind of the history. And so he was the professor in Cambridge University in England whose lab was studying it. Then the two guys, the next guys, next one, are guys who were students in his lab, graduate students in his lab, you know, probably back in the 1970s, sort of 80s, like that. And, and the middle guy, look how tired he looks. His name is John Sulston, and we're going to start with him. And he won a Nobel Prize because of the overall team effort. And this is what John Sulston did. And just remember, he looks exhausted. So what he did is... He watched in uh, under these uh, DIC microscopy. He watched this development of individual worms, and he he just uh, used uh, you know like uh, bookkeeping to label each cell just on on paper and pictures. Label each cell, and he discovered that the C. elegans always develops with the same pattern of cell division. And that's depicted here. So this is John Sulston's contribution. And at the top of the slide is a fertilized egg. And then time goes uh, on as we go down the slide. 
And what it's showing here is the cell divisions. So up at the very top, you can see a cell is dividing into two, and then those two cells divide further, further, further. And C. elegans is, is said to have what's called an invariant cell lineage. So we could tag the cells at any point, and we know what they're going to become. They always divide in that same way. Other organisms do not do that. Humans do not do that. Other animals don't do that. C. elegans does. So it becomes an advantage. And in both of these stories, the scientists take advantage of C. elegans' invariant cell lineage, which was discovered by um, John Solston. And that's why he looks really exhausted. Okay, so what is that like? And so we're just going to look at this a little bit more. So here's uh, uh, this invariant cell lineage. Start out with a fertilized egg. It divides into two cells, and Selston could label them A, B, and P1. You know, just a temporary kind of accounting thing. And he found that, say, for example, that P1 went on to divide, and see down there in purple, P1 was responsible for eventually producing the germline. The germline. We'll learn about that term in our course. The germline cells are the cells that could make sperm or egg. So those are the reproductive cells in any animal. And it's the P1 cell, right? So the fertilized egg could make all the cells in the body. The P1 could make the germline. See, the AB cell never makes the germline. It makes other body parts. So that's the idea of invariant cell lineage. And then the next thing is if we zoom in on that red box on the next slide, uh, we're looking at uh, early time. That's the, um, remember time is from uh, top to bottom on the slide. So that first uh, kind of row of lots of cell divisions, that's where the nematode embryo is forming. So remember we go embryo, larval one, larval two, larval three, larval four, larval uh, adult, right? Okay, so that's the stages of development from top to bottom, that top one, in that red box, that's looking at the embryo. And when you zoom in, what Solston found were that in the embryo, see all these X's in the embryo, those are cells that died, that just disappeared like that. And um, this was back in, you know, like the 1970s like that. And um, scientists had seen examples of what they thought were programmed death, cell death in other animals, including humans. But it was very hard to study and, and prove, they, and it was just so contrary, right? Here we have an embryo. Why would cells form and then die? And the answer is, we know now, is because they play a function, they do a function, that function is done, and they die. And so in natural embryogenesis, a bunch of cells die like that. And that's true for our bodies too. During our embryogenesis and fetal development and throughout our life, a bunch of cells die like that, right? Okay, so there he sees it. And so there's the starting point is the very, very specific and reproducible example of programmed cell death. So now we can look at it using a genetic strategy. Now we have an assay look with the IC optics to see if the cells have died and we can do induced mutations and search for nematode mutants that are a problem. We can breed those mutants and study that gene. And that's what this next guy did, who uh, has the necktie on and is leaning forward. And uh, that's Bob Horvitz. And Bob Horvitz is a geneticist like that. So does these breeding experiments and then uh, mutations and hunts for genes. And he's hunted for genes in his lab uh, for a lot of topics, not just program cell death, but that's one that he hunted for is program cell death, and that's our first story. So, Bob Horvitz got trained in um, Sydney's lab in England. Then he got a job as a professor at MIT down in Boston, and Horvitz's lab has about fifty people in it: graduate students and postdoctoral fellows and technicians. Just a huge army of people, and they back in the nineteen nineties were all doing the same thing. They were doing genetic screens in labs. And MIT is pretty close to Boston, uh, to uh, uh, Fenway Park, where the Red Sox play. And all the people in his lab are big fans of the Red Sox. And so they would search for mutants unless there was a game. And then he'll go over to the game and watch. And I mentioned that, again, we don't know these people, but it puts a kind of setting on it, you know, 
for you to think about, right? MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, is a world famous uh, university. And these people were studying these C. elegans worms. Seems like kind of useless work at the time. But these are really smart people and they're really hardworking, except for when there's a baseball game, okay? And he's leaning forward because he is, you know, 24 you know, seven kind of worker like that, okay? So they do these genetic screens. And now we're just gonna talk about that. Oh, I haven't mentioned this before, and that is, you may have heard of programmed cell de death before. If you have, it, they, it was referred to as apoptosis. And there are actually two major forms of programmed cell death, apoptosis and autophagy. It turns out in development, developmental biology, autophagy is more common than apoptosis. And that's why, just to tell you why, that's why developmental biologists tend to call this programmed cell death, is that. We're really talking about apoptosis. That was what uh, Bob Horvitz's lab was studying in nematodes and finding out the genetic uh, um, regulators of apoptosis, okay? So again, back to this idea that they're gonna be doing those kind of induced mutations and searching for genes. And so, um, just skip over here. And uh, we're gonna have down at MIT in the lab, we're gonna have induced mutations random and they're random so then you have to do a genetic screen and a genetic screen is where you have mutations and then you have an assay some way of screening those to say if we identified a mutant that has a um, so you find an individual uh, nematode that is a problem with program cell death and so you save it and you breed that, okay? And, um, and, um, and that's called a strain. And, um, and we can just name, number them. We can say that's number one. So you do a genetic screen and that screen, that, uh, that screen can involve tens of thousands of nematodes because it's not just one gene that's involved in program cells. There's some kind of genetic pathway leading to program cell death, and so we want to find them all. So here's one strain that's going to have one gene with a random mutation. So it's going to be a new allele of that gene that's defective, like that, or, or you know, altered somehow. So it's got a problem. And in the screen, we find another strain and another strain. And we just keep, the students just keep searching for those uh, because each one is gonna have one gene and one gene like that, okay? All right, so these might have the same gene mutated. So let's just label these and make up some labels. Let's say this has a gene that we'll call A. And this strain also has a mutation in A, but this strain has a mutation in B. Both genes are involved in programmed cells, so cell death, so they both give the same mutant phenotype, the same appearance, but we have a set of these. And we have more than just three because the students just keep searching because they want to search and find all the genes like that. And so they might find several alleles, right? Each of these are alleles, a version of the gene, and these are probably different alleles, right? They're said to be independently identified. So a random mutation probably in a different place in that gene and then a place in another gene, okay? The way that the students learn what they've found is they do breeding experiments. And the breeding experiment is where they're gonna cross breed these different strains like that. They're going to crossbreed them, and they're going to ask what kind of babies they have. And that breeding is called a complementation test cross, or just complementation. And uh, here's what that means. Um, and I'll just try to keep drawing on this, although it's getting messy. Okay, so. Um, if we have, let's just, uh, I'll, we'll do this up here in a general sense. Let's say here's a gene 
and you got one version from mom and one version from dad. And here's another gene, different gene, and you got one from mom, one from dad. Okay? So we have two copies of an insulin gene in our body. We got one from our mom, one from our dad. Two um, copies of the hemoglobin gene, one from mom, one from dad. Okay? So if this one from mom you got is a mutant allele and it's defective, uh, you might be okay because you still have a good copy from dad, like that. Okay, so this is the idea. And so when we do this complementation test cross, what we're asking is, are these the same gene? In this case, this is gene A, and these guys have different mutations in gene A. So strain two carries this mutation, that could be one parent, and strain one carries this mutation. That's the other parent. So the mom and dad give this offspring a defective version of gene A. And in a complementation test cross, these are mutant. The progeny is mutant, okay? On the other hand, when we cross with strain B, and I'll just try to redraw this, so with strain B, uh, or strain 3, which has got a um, mutation in strain B. So when we use these two as parents, we are going to have a mutation in one of them and uh, another one. And when we use these as parents, what we get as offspring looks like this, where um, we can have... Um, Oh, I should have done it like this. Let me see how to do this. So actually, if these are the parents, we would start out with parents that have two mutations like this. Okay? And when we do that cross, we have to remember that for these parents, these are the parents. So this is what the te confirmation test cross looks like, is one parent, the strain error A parent looks like that. The strain error A parent has a mutation in gene A, but not gene B. And the strain 3 parent has a mutation in gene B, but not gene A. When we do these crosses, we're going to get this uh, baby. And the baby is going to get two versions of gene A, one of which has a mutation in it. And it's going to get two versions of, strain of gene B, one of which has a mutation. And so in this case, because the mutations are in different genes, we end up with babies that are heterozygotes. And those babies are fine. So, remember that we just talked in the last couple of minutes about two complementation test cross. When we cross strain 1 from strain 2, for strain 2, both of those happen to have mutations in the A gene at different locations, and as a result, their babies are mutant and still have the problem with programmed cell death. The second complementation cross we talked about was this one where we cross strain 2 with strain 3, and those we get heterozygous progeny, and they are healthy. And for this competition test cross, we say that this cross, we say these two strains complement each other. You know, remember, complement is to say something nice about somebody. So they help each other, or are, are positive, in that their offspring are healthy because the uh, original strains have mutations in two different genes. Okay? On the other hand, these guys do not complement. So they don't complement when they cross strain 1 and strain 2. And the students at MIT in Boston go through all of their strains. They might have 40 strains. They do complementation test cross, and they organize the strains into two categories. Um, one is um, 
different alleles of the same gene so they could have multiple strains that all have mutations in um, gene A. They can have also strains that have mutations in gene B. They can have strains that have mutations in other genes, right? So over here, we have organized by competition test cross our strains into categories that uh, complement because they're in different genes like that and then don't complement because they're alleles in the specific genes like that, okay? And um, so um, that's what the results of a complementation test crossed are. Um, and the scientists are really especially interested initially, they're interested in the fact that we found several genes. In the long run, as the students study those individual genes, having multiple alleles for one gene is very valuable. And I'll just describe a little bit about what that's like here. Okay? So, um, we're going to make a kind of um, a little bit of a graph, or it's not a graph, it's just a line of, um, uh, with a range. And this line is a range of uh, gene activity. And um, we would say here is uh, the gene is active and it's got 100% activity. And it could go down or up like that. But this uh, gene has 100% uh, activity. And this allele we call wild type. So that's our starting allele in genetics, and it's a wild type, it's normal, and we say that's 100%. You never see this line drawn because it's kind of impossible to measure the activity, like to quantify it and say it's 100%. But in theory, you can. In theory, you can say, oh, okay, so this is one allele, one version of this gene, and it's any gene, all genes would fit into this drawing, any gene, it's got 100% activity. So now we do uh, mutagenesis, uh, induced mutagenesis in a lab. We start searching for new alleles, and we find new alleles. And um, they really typically will have lost activity because we're doing a random mutagenesis, right? And that's more likely to damage than to help a gene, okay? And so Again, you won't see this, but just in theory, you can imagine that these are 72%, you know, 51% of activity, 21% activity, and 0% activity. 0% activity is super interesting. Scientists love to study that. That's called a null allele. Completely wiped out it, the gene function, so you can study whatever that gene does. You can study it in that organism, like that. Okay? So, there's lots to say about this. Um, and again, we don't know this, but like um, at some level of activity like that, um, you uh, see a problem. So like, let's say it's here and it'd be different for different genes, but these genes have a mutation. They have de defects and they have reduced activity, but they're still okay. This gene, or this allele and this allele uh, version they have problems, and we see the mutant phenotype, a problem with programmed cell, cell death or whatever we're studying. If you take these two alleles and uh, cross them together, um, they don't complement, and um, and in some cases we would you know see that problem more clearly because they have two versions of this weakened allele. So there's a lot to say about that. What we want to do is introduce some terminology that we use. So, whenever you have a allele with decreased activity, it's called a hypomorph. So, a genetic term, and again, developmental biologists are big time genesis. And in our book, our book uses the term, which is synonymous with hypomorph, loss of function. Okay? And so, these are all loss of function. Uh, the other uh, mutations that can occur are ones that have an increased activity and those are called hypermorphs or gain of function 
and gain of function um, is a good term and uh, just to talk about this a little bit um, so what on this graph we think of gain of function as being like an increased activity like that oh more activity right and that's true if the mutation is um, if the mutation is in the transcription unit we might through a mutation make a product that is actually more active so hemoglobin that that binds to the oxygen strong more strongly like that okay gain of function includes also mutations that we've talked about that are in uh, the regulatory region so gain of function also includes a new expression Right, the regulatory region uh, uh, regulates expression of when, where, and how much of the gene gets made. And um, these types of mutations are also gain of function. They wouldn't have an increased activity. The activity would still be 100%. So this isn't a perfect analogy because these hypermorphic alleles don't necessarily have more activity they have what scientists like to say is they have new activity more or just different and um, lots and lots of evolution occurs through these evolution occurs through these gain of function hypermorphic mutations like that um, in the lab at MIT, they're mostly studying these hypomorphic loss of function because those are much more common, and that's what they want to find anyway is these decreased loss of function alleles. So loss of function, decreased activity, gain of function, new activity, more activity or new where, when, or what, how much, like that, okay? So some genetic terms, again, that we'll use a little bit in the book, and this, this um, course is not all about genetics, and one way we... Uh, have that happen is we especially say well we think about uh, nematodes we learned about them and how much genetics is done with them lots of genetics done in fruit flies and mice and it's the same kind of story but we'll just turn our minds in order to you know kind of package our learning into locations we'll turn our minds to these nematodes to tell all those stories okay so the scientists did that and they did complementation test crosses, and then they studied each of the genes that they had found at MIT. And um, then they started studying the biochemistry of those genes and the products. And the products were proteins, and the proteins had functions. And they could, through biochemistry and more genetics, they could produce a, like a pathway of activity and so this is from our book but it's not covered until about chapter 8 and it shows that at MIT the scientists found um, these are four genes that code for proteins that are in this pathway to lead to programmed cell death and the idea of a pathway a genetic pathway of biochemical action one after the other is, is very very common in developmental biology so we'll see this a lot and there's some things to say about it uh, you know this is the first second third fourth uh, 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 playing a role and um, the uh, the fourth one does the action see that so this protein here uh, does the action to kill the cell and uh, it's a protein that in our bodies is called a caspase and a caspase is an enzyme that is a protease it cuts other proteins and it, it has specific target proteins not just any protein but it goes through the cell cutting proteins that lead directly to programmed cell death so this is the actual apoptotic killing protein and the proteins are present in every one of our cells right now Every one of our cells is po poised to go through program cell death. And it gets activated by this protein, 
But then, and this is common developmental biology, so we have this arrow showing activation and this block showing um, repression. So these cells, uh, these proteins are both poised to trigger programmed cell death, apoptosis, except they are repressed. So there's constantly a readiness in our cells to go through pro programmed cell death. It's thought because when cells get out of line, they should go through programmed cell death because they're leading to cancer. And so programmed cell death actually occurs by this protein relieving the repression that that program has on programmed cell death. See, so it's a pathway and it has some arrows and some blockhead um, 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 interactions like that. Um, I had this little slide. You might have seen um, cartoons like this. Uh, it's this cartoon artist named Rube Goldberg, and this is called the Goldberg contraption. And you can see there are multiple steps in this pathway. And they're surprising to see because they just don't make sense. Like, why do you have to have so many steps to get this person uh, um, a, to safely be able to safely fall down on the sidewalk? So this is like that too, and all developmental biology pathways are like that too, where there's regulatory steps, and some are activating and some are inhibiting, like that, okay? All right, so that's what Horvitz's lab discovered at MIT, and, and the scientists won a Nobel Prize in 2002, 20 years ago, and they won it because other scientists studied orthologs of these in other organisms. And so our book, again in a later chapter, has this, and the matched color balls are, are these conserved orthologs. And so you can see here that in mammals like us, there are orthologs of that. And we're going to learn off this list right now, we're just going to learn two of these. And the names we're going to learn are not the nematode name. So we're just going to learn two names ever off this. And that is not this, but these are the famous names. So in all animals, in every cell, there are a family of proteins, paralogs, called caspases, that are the effector proteins that cause programmed cell death by apoptosis and there are orthologs of those in every animal. So we leave behind the nematode name and we go with uh, what is now the famous name that you can read about in the New York Times because the, the, the program cell death is hugely significant and the breakthrough was done in nematodes. And here's the other one, BCL2. And BCL2 is an inhibitor of program cell death. Some cancers are caused because BCL2 gets an activation. So we have too much inhibitor, and as a result, not enough cell death, and the cancer cells are out of line, so, but they don't die because their programmed cell death is inhibited by an excessive amount of BCL2 like that. Amazing, right? And so those scientists won, oops, won a Nobel Prize uh, for stuff like this. Uh, here's a mouse embryo that is mutant for that caspase 9 gene and it has lots of problems because the fetus, this fetus, failed to have programmed cell death. You can see it has a much bigger brain. Lots of uh, cells in our brain have to die through programmed cell, cell death to have normal development. So we see a tremendous role for normal, in normal development of this program cell death using that pathway that is conserved, evolutionarily conserved in all animals, right? It just makes you cry to appreciate the significance of this. Tremendous significance in our health, normal development, and abnormal problems like cancer and other diseases like that. Yep, yep. Uh, so I just didn't mention that as I talked about here. Okay, so two uh, stories and uh, um, just fantastic to learn about program cell death and the history of how it was uh, discovered in a variety of organisms, but not convincingly, because why would normal healthy cells go through 
dead, you know, die. And then they found under a microscope in the nematode, they could find specific examples and they can find uh, through genetic screens mutations, mutations in the genes that regulate polar cell death. They could do complementation test cross and lots of other genetic analysis like that to organize these mutant strains into categories through competition test cross and say we've got you know four different genes represented here, lots of alleles of each, so we'll be able to really study them really well and, uh, and identify the genes of the DNA and sequence the DNA and read those letters and then use uh, computers to search for uh, uh, related genes in other organisms that do reverse genetics to prove in mice that when you mutate that caspase gene in mice, um, you had a problem with program cell death in mice too. So just a fantastic story. So now we're going to go on to the second one, which is about discovery of microRNAs and RNA interference. And here are the two authors, and you see the one are the two Nobel Prize winners uh, in this one, and see they're both astonished, and they're astonished because. Uh, again, you know, they were studying worms and, uh, or, you know, C. elegans nematodes, a lot of times people call them worms. Um, um, and um, uh, they're astonished to war win the Nobel Prize. Here's one reason that was astonishing is because these scientists were discovering RNA interference as a natural mechanism that was important in nematode development. And they're astonished because other scientists knew more about RNA interference than them. Why didn't those scientists win the Nobel Prize? And the answer is, those scientists were studying flowers. They were studying petunias. And just imagine winning a Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine for studying petunias like that. Can't even imagine it, right? like that, right? The Nobel Prize always in the newspaper and in history too. You're always thinking like, well, who won the Nobel Prize that year? And it's like somebody studying some flowers, right? And it's, you know, you know, they uh, deserve to win it, but they just weren't studying animals and these guys were. And it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it's about that complicated where you're just like, wow, you guys are lucky. Okay. All right. So what they did, what they did is, let me see if I find my picture again, is they studied these RNA interference microRNAs, the, the development they were studying is the timing of maturation or the watching the nematode grow up. And so they were studying um, this. They were studying that the animal hatches and it goes through L1, L2, L3, L4. And the way they studied it is kind of surprising. You know, they didn't do it by watching the time on the clock. What they did is they used this fact that there were specific patterns of cell division that happened at each of these stages. So there's the embryo, there's L1, L2, L3, and L4, and uh, the adult, you know, like that. They're at these specific stages. So they defined L1. So L1 is like a baby worm, right? And then we have like teen worm and like, um, you know, tw you know, 20 something worm like that, you know, like growing up, right? Over time. And rather than using a, you know, a stopwatch and timing, what they did is look for patterns of cell division. And our book shows this again also in, in those pages that we've read. So this story is also in our book and, um, and uh, in the assigned pages. And so they used that and what they did is they looked for mutants that would have lost this or mutants that repeated this over and over again. And they used that as an idea, uh, as a uh, way, like the phenotype for maturation. So they found mutations that would jump from embryo to like a teenager. And, you know, it's not a perfect analogy, right, for our bodies because we don't grow up this way at all. So we're related to nematodes in some ways, but not how we grow up and mature like that. Or they would find a nematode strain that just stayed a baby like that. It just kept, uh, you know, it shed its skin and it would still stay in that baby L1 state. So again, um, the way we grow up is very different. And that's because 
the way we mature uh, uh, evolved after our last common ancestor with nematodes. We don't grow up the same way as they do, but we grow up similar to how other mammals do because we're more closely related to them. What these scientists were studying is that, and what they discovered was RNA interference. So they found a natural process occurring and playing a role in this developmental story. And so they didn't win a Nobel Prize because of the developmental story. They won a Nobel Prize because of the molecular mechanism of RNA interference. So, um, so that's how they studied them. And in the book, it shows this. Oh, I have a slide here that I, I created to kind of show you that effect of the timeline like that. So each stage has uh, specific cell divisions that you could uh, screen uh, and look for defects, alterations in it. So this just shows, um, um, this is shown from the book. So you should see the book is showing this, how there are specific patterns in this. And, um, um, and then it shows uh, over here, the two genes that we use in our example. So they discovered two genes and they were numbering the strains, right? So we saw that, you know, they're doing a genetic screen and they're finding uh, new mutations and they just number the alleles and they do a complementation test cross. So here's a gene called LIN14 and a gene called LIN4. And they found that they were two different genes because they did complementation test cross. They got a lot of alleles of LIN4, a lot of alleles of LIN14. And in studying their biochemistry, they discovered this, that uh, there was lots of LIN14 present in the L1 stage, and then it went down in the L2 stage. And that's when LIN4 started to get expressed. So this gene is expressed early, and you could call it the, I wanna be a baby gene. I wanna stay a baby and be a baby. And the animal grows up because they found that this LIN4 genetic and biochemical action would repress this. So we get, we get the L2, L3, L4 stages, because LIN4 represses L LIN14, okay? And so they found, they found the genes uh, that were responsible for these, and um, that's a different story, and it takes a lot of work to you know, start out with a mutation and say, I wanna find the gene that's mutant, but they did. And what they found that was surprising is that LIN14, when they looked at the gene, has a long, big, long transcription unit, promoter, enhancer like that. So this is LIN14. And LIN14 had easily found in this long transcription unit, they could find that it has a coding region. And the coding region has the triple letter codons that the ribosome will use to translate LIN14 into a LIN14 protein. Okay, so this is a kind of gene, a category gene that we would call a coding gene that codes for a protein, codes for a protein. That's why it's called a coding gene, codes for a protein. And um, in the transcription unit, a portion of the transcription unit is the coding region that has the triple letter codons for each amino acid. And when this gene gets expressed, the RNA is referred to as famously as messenger RNA or mRNA because it has a message for the ribosome. It's bringing the message to the ribosome and the ribosome wanna translate, translate that message into a protein, right? So that's LIN14. And LIN14 is a coding gene like other coding genes. What are they? Insulin is a coding gene because it codes for the insulin protein. Hemoglobin, coding gene because it codes for a protein, a myogen, myoD, right? Like that, coding genes, code for proteins. When they studied this other one, they got a hold of this other gene, and they're, you know, just studying and looking along. And for LIN14, they found that it makes a very short transcription unit. Very, very short. And there's no coding region. Just very short. And it has a promoter and an enhancer, you know, it's a good looking gene, but the RNA it is made is very short, like that. And 
There are lots of genes that do not code for proteins. Uh, those are called non-coding genes. And um, like uh, they make an RNA and the RNA is the functional product. Coding genes is the functional final product is a protein. Not encoding genes, the functional protein a product is an RNA. Um, tRNA, transfer RNA, made from non-coding genes. Ribosomal RNA, made from non-coding genes. Uh, small nuclear RNA, made from non-coding genes. So there are lots of non-coding genes, and LIN4 was a non-coding gene. Huh, they were really surprised. Because Horvitz's lab had studied program cell death there just a few years earlier, and lots of other things, and they're just finding lots of coding genes. Good, you know, makes sense. Proteins working on a pathway, like, like that, right? So what is this? And what they found really quickly is they found in the short transcription unit of the LIN4 that the A, G, C, T letters of that, they were actually complementary to part of the LIN14 transcription unit. And that was a key thing, is that the LIN4 short RNA would actually bind to, would anneal to, would base pair with the LIN14 RNA. And that was the first step in identifying these as microRNAs. And the function of microRNAs is to bind to base pair uh, with a target, and then the double-stranded RNA gets targeted for destruction. And so this is this example of uh, naturally occurring RNA interference, and where we are going to decrease LIN14 expression by repressing it with this LIN4 microRNA. So this gene gets activated in L2, so there must be some protein binding to enhance or activating it at that developmental stage. And this gene, LIN14, it actually continues to be transcribed, and its function is to try to say, I want to be a baby, I want to be a baby, but the RNA that's being transcribed at these later stages gets destroyed because of base pairing with LIN4. So another one of these Goldberg contraption wacky things that the adult worm is expressing LIN14, whose function is to keep it a baby. Uh, but that RNA gets destroyed by RNA interference before um, the protein can get made and before uh, the protein can have its action to keep it as a baby. Okay, So the book shows this is what uh, LIN14 loss of function. So remember those genetic terms? We talked about loss of function of mutants. So this is a loss of function allele. It has a decreased activity like that. And when we have a loss of function, uh, LIN14, just remember they show that in this graph with that bar like that. So no activity, right? So what is this? This is a null allele, no activity, LIN14. And when they did that, they saw that the L1 cell divisions were skipped. So a LIN14 loss of function skips uh, L1 and jumps right to teenager. Again, you know, not like our bodies. Our bodies don't do anything like that, right? Can't imagine it, right? So different way of growing up. What we're focused on here is that RNA interference discovery at that cellular and molecular level, okay? But just to show you a little bit of the genetics, right? The book wants to show you this. So this is a gain of function of LIN14, so it's natural and appropriate, right? They show activity continuing like that. And uh, what's the gain of function mutation? So here's LIN14, and it, the RNA is being made all the time, and somehow it stays active. And they map those gain of function mutations. Where are the actual mutations in the gene? And the mutations mapped to that very short region that was complementary that could base pair with LIN4, right? So that, if for us, right, that makes sense, right? If LIN14 has mutation, or there's mutation here, 
it will not complement, uh, it will not um, bind to lymph 4 RNA and we won't get destruction. So the gain of function will just keep it active. Lymph 4 can't repress it. Okay. Then it says, right, uh, and this should make sense too from our brief genetic talk, here's lymph 4 loss of function. How'd that occur? There was a mutation in here that made it so it couldn't bind. And see the shifting terminology, right? So when you focus on what's happening to a mutation in this gene, it's getting a new activity, new activity. Now, it's not bad. It's not a loss of function. It's got function, and it's got more of it. It continues like that. So that's a gain of function, and this is a loss of function. And you know, because these interact this way, you can see the loss of function on this one it has the same phenotype as the gain of function. And so that's a nice, nice uh, image to have for us about loss of function, gain of function mutations, and how they map to uh, you know, molecular features of genes and the way that genes and gene products interact like that. And so then what's the actual phenotype? The actual phenotype is it just stays a baby like that. Okay, so really nice. And that um, reason we focus in on that is why do we talk? Why do we jump ahead and talk to this? Because that's what this course is like, where we turn our attention to C. elegans. And we say, you know, those scientists study it using that DIC microscopy. So we learn a little bit about microscopy and what that does. And it lets you look at the living worm and map that it has invariant cell lineage. And that gives you a starting point for genetic screen. And then we learn a little bit about uh, those terms in a genetic screening of loss of function, hypomorphs, gain of function, hypermorph, alleles, and collecting strains that each have a specific allele randomly uh, mutated by induced mutations. And then we do a computation test for us to get them into categories like that. And we find, you know, we have four genes represented, right, like that, okay? And then um, we study them further and um, we see the relationships between loss of function and gain of function mutation. And that allowed scientists in nematodes to rapidly, ahead of anybody else, except maybe petunias, scientists learn about RNA interference. And it let them, ahead of anybody else, study program cell death and really learn about the features of program cell death. And then other scientists, it was other scientists, found program cell death orthologs in other organisms, including us, and how significant they are in us. So let's give them a Nobel Prize. And then the other scientists studying microRNA, those, uh, you know, petunia people had already found other plants, and they're in all organisms, including us. So it plays a natural role. And then we talked, you know, about how um, you can have it play a natural role, but scientists can exploit it and uh, also knock down design. They can design microRNAs that would complement whatever gene they want to study, and they can knock it down. Okay, so um, the um, um, and so those are our two stories, and that's our 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 nematode and chapter six stuff. And I just want to put it in a video, partly because it's clear we're going to have a lot of awesome questions in class, like that. And we got to, those are, when questions come to class, those are fantastic. So bring questions to class, and we might have to put a couple little pieces off to the side here so you can see this before class and then ask questions in class. And I don't explain it all in class, okay? So a couple times this semester to help us keep rolling, I'll do this, and, um, and we'll go from there, all right? Great.